Thank God it's Friday. Good morning and welcome to Business Morning on Channel Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Uh, we're going to have uh, 55 minutes of great current and relevant business conversations. Let's start from the oil space now. Prices inched up today, but we're set to fall around 3% for the week after consuming countries. I agreed to release 240 million barrels of oil from emergency stocks to help offset disrupted Russian supply. Brent crude futures rose 13 cents to $171 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures advanced 35 cents to $96.38 a barrel. Analysts believe that emergency oil release, which amounts to about a million barrels per day from May, to the end of the year might cap price rises in the short term, but would not fully cover volumes lost from Russia due to the sanctions. Uh, the release may deter producers, including OPEC members and U.S. shale producers, from accelerating output increases, even with oil prices around 100 barrels. $100 a barrel, beg your pardon. At the same time, European Union's consideration of a ban on Russian oil following its plan to embargo Russian coal will limit any drop in oil prices in the near term. Coming to Nigeria now, the United Bank for Africa, UBA, has held a 60th annual general meeting and presentation of its annual report and accounts in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. The bank informed the shareholders that 2021 has been a satisfying year as evidence in the strong performance recorded across key financial metrics. The entrance of the chairman of the UBA group, Mr. Tony Lumelu, signals the start of the event as shareholders gather for the 60th annual general meeting of UBA. The chairman declares the event open. The company secretary welcomes guests and reels out the agenda for the day. To transact the following business. Ordinary business. One, to receive the audited financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2021, together with the reports of the directors, auditors, and the audit committee thereon. Two, to declare a dividend. Three, to re-elect the following directors retiring by rotation. Mrs. Owadari Duke, Erelu Angela Adebayo, Ms. Aisha Hassan Baba, OON. The chairman in his remarks informs the shareholders of the bank's many successes in the 2021 financial year. Total asset of your bank today, as at end of December, was $8.5 trillion and total deposit was 6.4 trillion naira. Significant improvement was also demonstrated in the group's earning capacity, illustrated by the 7% growth in gross earnings to 660 billion. Overall, our gross profitability grew by 20.3% further demonstrating our dominance in the financial services space. The diversity of our income base, a critical foundation of our long-term strategy, only increases with our African operations, that is ex-Nigeria, contributing approximately 63.2% of the profit for the year where truly and indeed a Pan-African bank. The United Bank for Africa is in 20 African countries and with a customer base of over 25 million people, the group's profitability grew by 20.3% with Nigeria contributing approximately 63.2% of the profits of the year. And the International Air Transport Association ITA says that air travel in Nigeria and other African countries grew by 34.7% in February 2022. ITA's record shows that Africa posted a strong rebound in February 2022 compared to uh, January 2022. Mr. Tayo Jury, 
the managing director of Aglo Aviation Support Services Limited, speaks to the details and the implication of this joins us is here in the studio. Good morning, Mr. Ojiri. Good to have you in the studio. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so uh, uh, when we say that uh, the aviation sector is recovering at such a time as this, it, it sounds like it's uh, contradictory. It's not contradictory, but if you look at that report, it's February. The ge geopolitical issue started mid-February. So, Late February, 24th, I yes, think. Yes, exactly. Mm. So it was right after... Uh, everything picked up. And look at the January numbers. The January numbers actually moved up because we had lots of end of uh, season, which is uh, one of the peak periods. The Christmas, uh, New Year's season is a major period for travel, uh, travel, air travel. So with that, you've seen lots of movement between January and February. And don't forget, we're just getting out of COVID. So there are lots of reduction and opening up gradually. We have actually tried to understand and master COVID-19 and all the variants, Omicron. So there were opening up of uh, restrictions. So that actually opened up travel numbers and air travel over time. January, you see numbers moved will move up in February. And then we had a damper. You see the numbers in March are going to go down. Not because I said so, but because the reality of what has happened with the geopolitical uh, issues, the, for, for us in Nigeria, the forex increase. For us in Nigeria, we see uh, the challenges with the price increase in domestic uh, flights as well. So all those affect the uh, uh, March numbers, and then we're going to see a reduction. Yeah, exactly, because I, I was going to say, if, if we were to look in, well, not look into the future, just uh, tell us what you think would be the figure for, for March. I don't think it would look that good, because this was the period we had uh, the threats to shut down by aviation uh, stakeholders. Uh, this was the period we've had, uh, I mean, even things like what happened in Kaduna and all that. So you have airlines not going to Kaduna. This, of course, is going to affect the overall figures at the end of the day. Yes. Um, there are a lot of in, uh, driving factors. We look at them it's, um, individually. We obviously, you did highlight the security challenges. Um, over and beyond that, we, had, uh, we have underlying economic issues, which is one, the inflation and suppose that the hyperinflation, where we're actually seeing 13.3% uh, uh, inflation rate, which is ha actually higher on the streets. And you have lots of increase in the foil not just aviation fuel, which moved from about 190, hovered from about 190 to about 700, now at a fixed about 500 to 505. 505 naira per Who's liter. Who's paying for that? I've been meaning to the find The passenger that. would have to pay for it. No, so, who's paying for? I mean, it's now fixed. It's, it's supposed to be 700, I think, because it's it's a it's a fully deregulated market. Yes. So, so now it's being fixed. So who is paying for that difference between 700 and five? Because if not, it will come back to hunt hunt us. Yes. End. So it's it was a, I wasn't at that meeting, but it was a meeting between the marketers, NMPC, the, and the airline operators of Nigeria, and so it's been able to cushion the effect on the traveling public. But the truth is. From where it was and to where we are now, that price has increased. And it's actually who would eventually pay for it is the traveling passenger. You've seen the travel pa uh, tickets increase significantly. And with that, we've seen a drop in travel market. Mm. So within domestic the, uh, travel market, we've seen a lot of uh, trapped funds for, do uh, for international airlines still trapped in Nigeria to the tune of about $283 million. So with that all set together, that's going to affect us within Nigeria in the next quarter, because we find out that this all this, the price of Jet A1 would impact on the increase in flight ticket. We're going to see the price of um, tickets itself, because we still have that one underlying factor, which is the, the uh, sourcing of Forex for for a, a big for challenge industry, for us, yeah. because 70% of all our operations are domiciled in, in, in Forex. So we still have that uh, those factors. Now, with the cost inflation, which is the reality in Nigeria, is affecting the cost of operations for most companies. So how many of these companies would actually be sending people to travel? That's going to reduce, and we're going to see that number, which is going to affect domestic uh, travel in the next quarter. Hmm. But having said that, we still see some lights. The light in the sense that we see the fact that it's an election year. There are lots of travel, there are lots of movement. 
So we see that that uh, trying to actually uh, over uh, override what is existing. Over and beyond that, we see the fact that there is a lot of, oh, we saw last uh, last week or early this week, we saw that the extension of the 2020, 2020 budget. Budget, yeah, to May, the yes. end of May. So with the, that money how coming... How does that effect, affect you? How, how is that a good news for the industry? It's good, good news for the aviation because our triangular route, which is Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, is driven domestic. And what drives that traffic is government business. So once there's more money within the circulation, you have people going in to sign their contracts, you have people in going to sign business, you have increase in FDA, uh, foreign direct investments, you have lots of transactions which actually pushes up the travel market. Because if you look at over time and what happens for us, what the reality, the foundation is for us within the travel uh, segment within Nigeria is the fact that 80 to 90% of our travel market on these routes are business driven. There's, it's not driven by visiting families. Yes, you have what you call visiting families and friends where you're going to visit someone for vacation or just a life-changing event, you're going for that party, all that matters, but it's not the driver on the street. So with that government spending, it's going to increase the, uh, the movement on that supposedly supposed to be increase that movement on that route on those routes okay so we know that uh, in the uk uh, in asia at this time covid has once again become a topic yes. but back here in nigeria we just had uh, um, uh, the secretary of federal, federal federal government you know announce some easing of restriction travel restriction less uh, tests a COVID test and, and other measures. How do you see this impacting activities in the industry? In the it's aviation? long overdue, I must tell you. Long overdue. We want to go come back to normal. Because normal... But yes, is it time to come back to normal, I guess? Well, when I should say the new normal. The new normal is, yes, have yourself uh, a jab, have yourself taking your uh, COVID uh, vaccines and have the first, second, and supposedly the third. Having taken that... You are, it doesn't stop you from having it, but you're sign of uh, take, uh, uh, you, you're prevented. That's preve you're, you're in that cycle, that, that cocoon of not being able to catch it. So what now op that opens uh, for us is you have the restrictions opening up, and it's not just Europe. You have Middle East, Dubai has opened up. You have Europe, you have North America, Canada dropped the restrictions on the 1st of April. So that helps non-movement. And don't forget that this actually affected lots of economies across the world. And right after that, right at the back of COVID happening, now we're having uh, the geopolitical Russia-Ukraine war. That's affected cargo as well. And even the Europe to Asia movement, because the travel has to go over Russia. So you have lots of diversion to go over Russia, and that's costing more money in travel, costing travel tickets, but all those things are making people wanting to come back to reality in the sense that we've seen the numbers. We looked at the travel, uh, travel uh, tickets that have been bought for summer, which is another high point for us within the innovation sector. We've seen that lots of people have bought tickets for summer travel, which is actually good uh, because the uh, global uh, reservation system shows that those book, the bookings are confirmed and it actually helps the travel sector revamp. But we still have the challenge within uh, mainland China and Shanghai, which is closed due to COVID issues. Yeah. Well, you, you know, with the war, uh, I had a lot of analysis, especially in the Western world, of how our planes have to take different routes to avoid Russia airs and all, uh, Russia skies and all that. For us in Nigeria, how has that impacted us? It's not it really impacted for us. We, domestic routes are still domestic routes, but we just have lots of, we still have the increase on, on international flights coming in, the normal passengers, and you just find out our passengers that come into Nigeria, the international segment is actually driven business and lots of Nigerians in diaspora. Lots of Nigerians. So when you look at that, about uh, uh, 17, 18 million Nigerians in diaspora, there are people coming in at every point in time for a life-changing event or for some things that uh, for investment in Nigeria and just to actually have that infinity that draws them back to Nigeria. So you see, have lots of foreign uh, movement into Nigeria, 
in the sense that now we have uh, two, uh, two um, U.S. Uh, fly, uh, airlines, legacy airlines. It used to be one prior, it used to be Delta. Now we have Delta and United coming into Nigeria, which shows that there's traffic and they're building that traffic. And you have the oil as well. Oil has been a major driver for that movement as well. So all that's affecting it. And ov ov obviously, we believe things will pick up in the second quarter for the international traffic. Mm. So when, uh, when you say that um, we have, uh, of course, the diaspora coming back home, but you did mention that most of our travel seems to be related to business. Or is that the domestic travel? The domestic. Okay. The domestic. Then the international is Inter more yes. of... Yes. The, do the demography of those is more of... You have business at about 60... Uh, well, I would say 50-50. You have the... That's for the international in travels. International, you have the business as well as the... Uh, what you call the visiting family as friend, VFR. Okay. So, um, some month, uh, I think it ended in March... Yes. ...where the government gave a concession where uh, businesses can pay some of their debts that are owed in dollars in foreign exchange, they could pay in, nine, nine, in Naira. Was that extended to the aviation sector? No. And you find that we, we, even your suppliers and you would not, service providers would not accept Naira because it's dollarized. It's a global phenomenon. And they accept their, most of the... You signed that contract in Naira, Sorry, in, in, uh, dollars. in dollars. Your lease are signed in dollars. So uh, all the maintenance, your spares are bought in dollars. Your trainings are domiciled in uh, dollars. So you have to make that payment in dollars. So that actually puts the domestic travel market, uh, travel operators in a very dire condition because they have to source uh, their dollars at a very high rate, either at the parallel market because they're not getting adequate funding for the request that they put into CBN. So how long will they be able to sustain their operations at this rate? It leaves so much to ask for. All right, so uh, finally now, what's your outlook? I know you, I think you touched on your outlook as we start the second quarter. What's your outlook for the second quarter? As we look at second quarter, looking at the crystal ball, we see that it's going to be uh si come, sir, in the sense that yes, uh, the dollar is still going to be a very huge determining factor. Fuel prices are still going to be high for us, which is affecting those two things affect operations, uh, flight operations a lot, and it's going to affect the number of equipment that goes out that are able to come in. So we have a few equipment, high cost of travel, reduced passenger traffic. It's not going to be good for domestic travel uh, traffic. Now on the international side, we have lots of money for international airlines still stuck in Nigeria. With that, it's going to increase the cost of tickets being purchased out of outbound Nigeria. With that ticket policy, that is going to reduce those that is not reduce those traveling outside of Nigeria, except you have a very pressing need. So you find that people would actually it's good for domestic market, domestic tourism, and domestic hospitality, but it's going to affect the outbound travel and even international airlines coming in to re, 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 uh, to take back their money out. Mm. So overall, come see, come sir. Come see, come sir. And how's this uh, um, airlines, you know, that have stopped going to Kaduna, how's that affecting us? It's, well, it's affecting the passengers because they, now you have that traffic, not just the passengers that need to move, you have goods that need to move, you have those that are actually tied into that economic value chain actually are now out of jobs. So it's actually affecting lots of other, not just the airlines, just all, all the other value chains within that system. Mm. So I don't know when they're going to start, start back uh, because they have to be reassured. And it's, this affects the insurance, by the way. Uh, the insurance yeah, premium, course, the risk. So with all, well. yes, with all this said, they have to ensure that this is put in place and they're reassured of when they can start uh, back the operations. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Tayo Jerry. Managing Director of Glow Aviation Support Services Limited. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us this it's morning. My pleasure. So that was the aviation. When we come back, uh, where well, we did touch a little bit on the issue of insecurity, this time we'll speak to the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. They've been talking a lot about that. We'll find out their perspective after the break. This is Business Morning on Channels Television. <laughs> The Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry is asking the federal government to deploy more technology and intensify its efforts at tackling youth unemployment.
been able to successfully address the worsening insecurity in the country. Well, we have Mr. Gabriel Idahosa, he's a deputy president of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to tell us more about their observations and their prefer likely solution. Good morning, Mr. Idahosa. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Yeah, so um, LCCI is asking for the deployment of more technology, but some Nigerians are saying that perhaps we do not have the infrastructure to maintain technology in that aspect, and uh, that should not be where to start from. How would you react to that? Well, the enhancements that we are talking about includes capacity to maintain, capacity to operate, and capacity to deploy rapidly around the country. So it all comes, all those competencies are come together. You have to have equipment, you have, you have to have the capacity to maintain, and you have, you need the capacity to rapidly deploy. So if you have equipment in Lagos and there's something in Port Harcourt and you cannot deploy very quickly, that equipment does not start, uh, meet the purpose. So that is the whole package of, um, Equipment itself, maintenance, operational, and mobility of equipment. It, it all comes together. And Nigeria has some deficiencies, but we, we certainly can quickly upgrade. We have continued to upgrade anyway. Hello, Mr. Dahosa. Anyway, it is just that we, uh, yes. Yes. Okay, because uh, we lost you for a bit there, so I, I, I didn't get what you said. But you talked about the issue of upgrading, continuing to upgrade. And uh, when we look at this, then I think the first thing that comes to our mind is, of course, this equipment will be imported. And we're talking about how to reduce our import bill, because eventually this we're, we're talking about expenses of the government borrowings by the government and what it does to infrastructure the same infrastructure we're talking about so it seems like it's a very tight cycle there uh, how, how do you see us starting off uh, remember after the um kaduna abuja train attack the minister of transportation talked about asking for three billion naira to get uh, uh, uh surveillance uh, uh, equipment you know and of course where would the three billion come from now we're talking of subsidy going from projected three, three trillion to four trillion. All of this make up expenses for the government. So we also have to consider the fact that this is capital intensive and we're not making as much uh, revenue as we should from our oil, which is our major stay. So where do we get the funding from? Well, unfortunately, we are forced to continue to borrow. That's, that's, that's the unfortunate part of it. We have to keep continuing to borrow, particularly because security cannot wait. Some other things can wait, but security cannot wait. So we are boxed into a situation where we have to borrow to get the equipment we need. But there is a steady improvement in local capacity to maintain this equipment, from the police to the Air Force, to the Navy, to the Army, we are seeing significant improvements in local capacity to maintain equipment. Every time you see a lot of improvements, you see capacity to, to fabricate, to maintain equipment, and all these security services are now working with private sector. They are working with Nigerian companies in engineering, in maintenance, and even fabrication. So it's, it's a slow process, but we have to borrow to bring in equipment and supports to meet the very urgent need of security. Beyond this urgent need, we can go back to look at uh, local content over time. But certainly, we just have to keep borrowing. That, that's, that's the dilemma we have. Without borrowing, we can't meet the very urgent security until there is significant improvement. All right, so um, you talked about local fabrication, very interesting, and this is, of course, what, we, what we're looking forward to. But most of the time when we talk about local-made or, or you know, homemade, 
it's like we talk about more of copulation where most of the components, if not all, are imported and they're just, uh, you know, put together here in Nigeria. Uh, I mean, you are in Lagos Chamber of Commerce. How much capacity do we have for local manufacturing or fabrication of some of these equipments that we really need? There is significant capacity. And everywhere in the world, manufacturing is about supply chain. There's no country in the world that produces all the spare parts for any equipment they produce. There's a worldwide supply chain that is locked into manufacturing. So what is important is for you to know where to get your spare parts at the lowest price. If the spare parts are produced in country, of course you want to use them. If the spare parts are available in Ghana or in Cameroon or in China, you want to get them. The essential requirement is the capacity that should happen. What we require is the capacity to design and manufacture. Over time, we will backward integrate. We will reduce the amount of parts that we import, but we certainly need to manufacture and import parts where we need to import. That is certainly what most countries do in the world. There's no country that even aspires to be able to manufacture all the spare parts, all the parts in one location, because it will be very, very uneconomical. The cost of production will be extremely high and will not be competitive, because all the parts of any manufacturing process are produced by specialists who concentrate on mass production of those parts. So Nigeria will not be different. As we grow our local manufacturing capacity, that supply chain is still very important, whether in country or from countries that we can access at a reasonable price and a reasonable logistical support. What about the issue of skills uh, uh, development, personnel you know, involved in this value chain? <laughs> How much of that do we have? The interesting thing is Nigeria is not short of skills. Whatever we feel we have skilled people, it is whether we are hiring and using them for that purpose. If you hire engineers, for example, and they are working in the office, where they should be in the factory floor or in a design lab, then you are underutilizing those skills. We have lots and lots of skilled people looking for work in Nigeria. But adopting the manufacturing design and supply chain strategy that ensures that the right people are hired at the right places is what we need to do. Both within and outside the country, we have Nigerians working for the largest manufacturing organizations from their homes. A lot of work is now done remotely. So you can actually hire Nigerian experts in any part of the world to be part of your manufacturing design and manufacturing team. But it is the desire, the competence of those in charge of governance and management to pull all those resources together that we are actually talking about at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Okay, so as LCC, I, of course, should be concerned about the issue of security because it affects uh, every other aspect of the economy and life. Are you having conversations with the government or what other moves? Are you making, you know, towards at least sharing your thoughts, sharing your ideas about how to solve this problem? Yes, we do. We have very frequent conversations with the federal government and with the Lagos State government. Those conversations are ongoing as we speak, and we are privileged to know that government is doing a lot more than is in the public space to address these security issues. But we have to keep working on this continued work in progress, we need to keep uh, drawing attention to these issues. And government is telling us what is going on. We, 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 we have significant information of what government is doing, and we believe that these efforts will yield results. It is just that the terrorists seem to be running faster than government at, uh, uh, at least at this point in time. That is just the challenge, but government is doing a lot that we are aware of, and we have the privilege of direct information and communication with both the federal and the Lagos state governments. So that means you would not agree with former President Olusegun Obasanjo that the government has been overwhelmed 
uh, by the issue of insecurity? So I, I think at some point, on a day-by-day -day basis, there might be incidents that will give that impression that the federal government is overwhelmed. But taking the entire activity of defending the country together, we cannot say the, the government is overwhelmed. Uh, overwhelmed means that the terrorists have overrun the country, moving to us around and, uh, and around the government. That, that's, that's where we talk of being overwhelmed. They are meeting, they are having challenges on a day by day basis. They are trying to address those challenges. But as we said, on the day by day, the terrorists seem to be one step ahead of government, and government is doing a lot of catch up. But that catching up is happening. Um, it, it, it may be right to say at some point in time, government is overwhelmed, the security forces are overwhelmed, and then do you see the security forces rising to the occasion and, and then? And uh, we, we see from almost on a weekly basis, the security uh, forces going forward to, to address uh, the most uh, challenging situations. While we do know that they are also working in the background to have holistic uh, solutions. Some of these solutions take a while to manifest, but yeah, on a day by day basis, you can say, yeah, government is overwhelmed today. But I, I will not say, I, I don't think most Nigerians believe that the government is overwhelmed completely um, for all time. It's, all right, it's, it's a war, so mm. you may lose all the right. battle today and tomorrow you win. <laughs> yeah, well, lose the battle but not lose the war, I guess. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, you, you are also concerned about uh, youth unemployment. And then uh, we have impressions that perhaps a lot of youth in Nigeria are not as innovative and creative as they should be, or they are being laid back. When, so when you talk about youth unemployment and you connect it to insecurity, what from your, uh, from your perspective seems to be uh, fueling you know, the youth unemployment in the country? Well, that, that, that is really the big picture. When the government talks of non climatic um, efforts to reduce the insecurity, that really is the big picture. Most of the young people who are recruited by the terrorists are only recruited because they are unemployed. That is that simple. Every young man that is gainfully employed has a good, interesting job that he leaves home every day to do. It's not likely to be attracted into the forest to work for the, the leader of the terrorist group. So the unemployment is the big picture. It's the big picture that all governments and private sector are talking about. We need to address the rate at which we reduce unemployment. Uh, reducing unemployment by, say, 500,000, 1 million here and there by one government project or the other is something, but it's not enough. So the, the, the real issue is how we can quickly fight unemployment. And that takes us to the general policies of government economic policies that will generate that employment. If, if you look at, for example, the issue of oil subsidy, and you look at the telecom industry, you see how much employment is created in the telecom industry because the right policies were in place for the last 20 years. But you don't see that kind of employment being created in the petroleum downstream or midstream sector of the economy. We don't, we don't have... 50 refineries all over Nigeria that can hire a lot more people. We don't have chemical companies that can hire a lot more people because the fundamental policy in that sector of our economy has not been addressed. The way it was addressed in telecom, the way it was addressed in the financial services. We have our banks all over Africa today because a few years, 10, 15 years down the road, we had a policy that transformed our banking industry. We had a policy 20 years ago that transformed our telecom industry. If we had a policy that transformed our power and oil and gas sectors in the last 10, 20 years, a lot of the unemployment you are finding now will not be there. So that's why really, not just the Lagos Chamber of Commerce, but all other uh, business organizations of the private sector say that government must have the courage to address those fundamental policies. Why did we not have so many refineries built in Nigeria? Nigeria is very much like the Houston or, or the, 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 
the Calgary and other major oil regions of the world, which are sort of dotted with refineries, several refineries in very small areas. You can find 20 refineries and petrochemical plants in small areas, even smaller than our Niger, Niger Delta, and can create all the jobs that you want to create. But that, those fundamental policies need to be addressed. There's no other way you can reduce employment by one government action that creates jobs for maybe 2,000 people or 5,000 people. Right, uh, Mr. Gabriel Idahosa. Um, well, thank God you say you're in talks with the government. So we do hope that when you share these thoughts with the government, that we would see it uh, come into, you know, implementation in the various policies. We do have a lot of policies, as you have noted, but some have said there are policies, but implementing those policies is another story. But thank you so much, Deputy President with the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Gabriel Idahosa for sharing your thoughts with us. Enjoy Thank you. your weekend. Thank you. So let's uh, go to the market now. And that uh, responsibility falls on me this morning. We start with the equities. The all share index was down yesterday, uh, almost half a percent. Well, we seem further away from that at 47,000 level going further, further. Now it's just 46,000, 543.51 Point and the equity cap also in the red, 20, just about 25 trillion naira yesterday. I think the market lost about 120 billion naira after at the close of trade yesterday. It wasn't a very good day now. And then uh, looking at the activity chart, it was more of red as expected, even though we had more deals. Um, volume was 244 million. Value was 3.35 million. And, um, well, deal was all, the only one in the red. We see there was a lot of markdown in MTN Nigeria. And then the, um, accordingly, the month-to-date loss increased to 0.9%. Uh, the only sector that uh, escaped yesterday, when we look at the sector of performance, was the oil and gas. It added 0.39. And industrial goods remain on change. Banking in the red, consumer in the red, insurance in the red. A lot of profit taking still ongoing there. That's what we see in the market or that's what we saw yesterday. In the unlisted market, the NAS DOTC, we saw that the, their share index was in the positive almost half a percent. Well, opposite the flip side of what's going on in uh, the equities and then its market cap was at um, still getting close to that one trillion naira that we are looking forward to. With only 21 deals executed yesterday, valued at 33.2 million uh, with 1.39 million uh, units traded at the unlisted market yesterday. Quite a, a very act active there, we see. Uh, let's go to the fixed income market now. In the fixed income market, we see that uh, uh, and the federal government bonds were 10 deals uh, valued at 3.02 billion naira. And the 27th of March, 2035, uh, really caught the attention of a lot of investors. There were four deals on that security. And next to that was the um, 22nd of, of May, 2029 there. And uh, from there, we go to the NTB deals. On the NTB deals, the treasury bills, we saw that it was bearish. A lot of bearish sentiments we saw. The average yield expanded by nine basis points to 3.3% across the curve. Most of the day's activity was witnessed in the long, in the long uh, end of the market. Participants demanded a lot of the 3 to 2 uh, day to month bill. Well, the average yield was flat at the short end and the mid segment. Similarly, average yield was unchanged at the three, at the three point six percent in the OMO segment. That's talking about what happened in the OMO segment there, with only seven deals valued at three point nine million naira. There we see the seventh of February, twenty twenty two, had four deals, while the twenty eighth of March, twenty twenty three, had. Um, Three deals. So remember that in May, we're expecting a lot of liquidity in the market because we're going to see a, a lot of the securities uh, mature 
in the month of May. So that will be something to look out for and see how the market will react to that, how investors will take their step after that. Well, that's what happened in the market yesterday. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll head to another market to stay with us. This is Business Morning on Channel Television. Yeah, welcome back. Let's get to the crypto market now. Um, it's a wet Friday. I hope it's not a red Friday. Well, it's, uh, it's not totally red, you know. But is it better than yesterday? I know yesterday we had a lot of fear in the market. Yeah, it's better. You know, we saw global markets have some kind of recovery, yes. you know, yesterday. Even this morning, the FTSE in, in the UK exactly. was up. Exactly. There, mm -hmm. There's some recovery, and we see Bitcoin also trying to, you know, pull back some of those losses. So it's not totally red, but there's some red. It's orange. It, it's quite mixed, <laughs> you know, this morning. And looking at the uh, sentiment right now, it's 37 points. That's uh, fear, talking about the fear uh, greed index, showing you know how traders are feeling in the market yeah, right yesterday now. Yesterday it was 24, so it's better today. It, it's, it's better, but it's nicer when it was at neutral, you know, yes. tending into greed, mm -hmm. you know, showing that people are making money, but now it's fear in well, the market. But now it means you can get point. into the market if you want to. Well, some some traders like to buy, you know, the fear, you know, sell the greed. It all depends on your risk appetite at this point. But we're seeing the market cap trying to build up some uh, momentum there. It's, it, it was at two trillion yesterday. I was expecting it to fall below that, but we're seeing a little markup there. It's up by 0.91 percent. But a volume traded this morning in the total crypto space as Bitcoin uh, plus the altcoins. We're seeing about 30 percent drop. Uh, in volume there. Bitcoin dominance, 40.97%. And the top of the market cap, we're seeing uh, a, a, quite, a, a little gain there, you know, with BNB. Uh, but the biggest mover we're seeing this morning is Solana. Solana did get as high as about $136 uh, when it had that run uh, a few uh, days ago. But now we're seeing it trying to pull back some of those uh, losses there. It's up by 4.94%. XRP did lose the $0.80 cents mark, now trading at 78 uh, sense this morning. So, you know, we're seeing the market, you know, trying to find direction. <laughs> Maybe uh, this weekend could, you know, get yeah, a little so, well, uh, you know, uh, juicy with some traders looking for uh, some cherry picking, you know, yes, in the market and I at this point. I think that traders are also looking at new sanctions in Russia exactly. and how, uh, you know, uh, the oil is going, the, the equities, you know, they are also looking to see. Is it safe for us? Is yeah, is it safe to, to get in? Yeah. A lot of uncertainty, but there are some very high risk appetite investors who are like, this is the time, get this into the, the time, market, you know, buy make the some investment. Exactly, and but the, the, the fear now is you don't want to catch a falling knife. You know, what if, what if you buy the fear and it keeps, you know, and going keeps lower going down and lower. the fear route. Exactly, so at the end of the day, there's a lot of uncertainty. Not easy, you know, being a, an investor, you know, in these uh, kind of markets, but at the end of the day, profit is being made. Any market at made. all, laddie. Any market no at market, all. No market is easy. No market, making no market. Ma making money can be easy, e exactly. else everybody will be rich. Exactly, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, bring in uh, Michael and Aji now. We have uh, Michael right there. Hello, Michael. Happy Friday. Happy mixed Friday. Happy Friday, laddie. Thanks for having me <laughs> on. Happy Friday. Uh, great to have you. So I, I see the Bitcoin 2022 conference you know, in Miami, it's, it's uh, been on uh, for days now. And, you know, a lot has gone on there. We're seeing some partnerships there with uh, uh, Jack Mollers there, you know, partnering with the uh, e-commerce giant uh, Shopify, you know, to launch the Bitcoin Lightning uh, Network. That's quite uh, bullish for the market. Uh, yes. Uh, so finally, Lightning Innovation is uh, get, getting on stream. And so... People are now starting to integrate Lightning into their consumer products. Um, so Robinhood and BitPay, um, Robinhood being one of the largest exchanges, has now integrated the Lightning wallet on their platform, as well as BitPay, which is one of the largest, largest merchant, uh, merchant um, wallet providers. Um, so, you know, Lightning is one of those um, things that's been hoped to scale Bitcoin. Um, so basically, it's a side channel that's a closed loop that you have to uh, bond uh, assets on so that you can then have closed settlement transactions that are later settled on the blockchain, uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it's really a move to get, uh, you know, 
one second, uh, you know, millisecond latency to send transactions across the world that is ultimately settled by Bitcoin. Um, also, as well, you saw um, Tora, um, a project by um, one of the largest, um, uh, I believe it's Blockstream. Um, so basically what's going on there is um, Tora is a stable coin, um, a, a stable coin software solution to basically have stable coins on that lightning uh, on that lightning lab blockchain, I believe. Um, so you're, you're seeing stable coins being issued um, on the you know Bitcoin sidechain. Um, so eventually the 159 billion dollars in the stablecoin regime, Will now be available on Bitcoin as well, and you know you saw uh, people like Peter Thiel um, say things like Bitcoin will never be controlled by government, on like world companies, and uh, and he, he had, he had that, a lot to um, say about Warren Buffett too at, at the conference. Yeah, he called him he called him a grandpa <laughs> sociopath. Yeah, quite um, quite so, uh, strong words there. <laughs> yeah, because you know people have been saying for the longest time if you. Uh, you know, you, you can't just keep on be missing it and claim to be one of the best investors in the world. You know, he, uh, you know, Warren Buffett ended up still buying Apple after like 20 years of taking him to understand it. So, at the end of the day, like I, I still believe, like with this is bullish um, in the grand scheme, scheme of things, but that isn't to be forgotten that the Fed is continually, you know, trying to trim that balance sheet. Um, the Fed minutes came out, and so we have, you know. $95 billion that they're just going to let roll off um, is what they're looking at based on the Fed minutes released. So that's almost double what they were um, trying to shrink the balance sheet back in, uh, I believe it was 2018 or uh, 2017. So um, this is quite unprecedented. Uh, also with the rate, with the rate hikes, um, the European um, euro dollar market is showing that, you know, the Fed will hike, but sometime in 2023, they will have to cut some of these hikes. So, you know, the right. the monetary regime that's coming up is looking pretty bleak. Um, but I think these developments for coming from the Bitcoin pro conference is promising um, for when eventually the Fed breaks the markets and Bitcoin decouples and becomes right. that reserve asset of the world. Right. Well, we're seeing, you know, quite bullish news, you know, uh, coming uh, from the, uh, the conference. But we're also... We also see, you know, uh, uh, traders actually, you know, interested in what's happening, you know, with the Fed. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Let's hope, you know, we see more gains uh, this weekend. Thank you, Lady. All right, thank you. All right, so, uh, any, uh, there we have it. We've seen uh, Bitcoin there trading at $43,589 uh, this morning. It's been ranging, you know, but after losing that 45000 uh, mark, and obviously that's, you know, bearish for most uh, traders, and we see the bears actually trying to push that price uh, lower volume trade at $23.81 billion, and we've seen Ethereum there. It lost the 3,500 markets uh, up by 1.49% this morning, you know, with the recovery happening in the market. Uh, volume trade at $15.99 uh, billion, and you see the top gain is there. We're, we're seeing just one double-digit gain. That's near protocol, up 26%, uh, percent, Ine. So it's not a full Red Friday. Some gains are being made. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope for more gains over the weekend. Thank you so much, Laddie, taking us into the world of crypto. And that's it for this week on Business Morning. It's been really great having you on the other side and being on this side. Let's do it again next week. But before then, 1.30, Business Incorporated will be here and we'll give you updates from the world of business. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Enjoy your weekend.